Hello everyone, welcome to another video. Um, today I want to talk to you about a solo that had a huge impact on the way I think about music and it's a solo by the great George Benson. It's a solo from 1982 that you can find on YouTube if you look for George Benson and Stand By Me and he's singing this song with uh, Wonder Woman, Linda Carter and during that performance it's a live performance. He takes a short solo, two choruses. In fact, he was about to go for a third one, but then Linda Carter interrupted him. And I wish it could have gone on forever because, in my opinion, there is so much to learn from this solo. A lot of things about music in general, not just jazz guitar. But first, you know, all these videos that I do for free <laughs> on my YouTube channel, I think they're of high quality and they're free i don't have any patreon or anything like that but i do have courses for sale so if you want to support me maybe you can consider buying something on dc music school where i've produced lessons for a lot of wonderful players or you can buy some of my courses on sound slice um, i'm particularly proud of my harmony course as well as the course on jazz phrasing uh, which is kind of related to what we're going to talk about today you can also buy some music, and if you're playing gypsy jazz, I wrote a book on gypsy jazz picking that was just released a month ago. It's the best seller, it was anyway, I don't know if it still is, best seller in, uh, in America in the new, new releases category, new releases jazz guitar, jazz category, or jazz guitar, I don't remember. Anyway, yeah, if you want to support me, maybe you can consider buying something. Um, if you don't have any money, I totally understand. You can maybe just like, subscribe, share, comment, all that will make a huge, huge difference in the YouTube algorithm. We must please the algorithm. Okay, so let's get started. So the, the title may seem a bit controversial or clickbaity, but I kind of stand by what, I, what it says. Sometimes playing simple can be extremely, extremely difficult. And... Uh, Especially when you have super simple songs. I mean, this is not a jazz tune, right? It's a, it's a pop tune that they're playing in kind of a pop funk style, funk jazzy style. And the, the, the chord progression is super diatonic. It all stays in one key. And George himself, from a theoretical perspective, is not doing anything fancy at all. And a lot of people, when they talk about George Benson, they talk about his jazz guitar playing, how great it was. It is, still is. <laughs> But and it, it wonder it definitely is. But personally, I've I was always fascinated by his uh, pop music, and especially when he would take a little solo over his pop tunes. Now sometimes he would play jazzy lines for sure, but sometimes he would do things like this, and I think this solo is just perfect. It's an improvised solo, you can tell, but it's just so perfect. I wouldn't change anything about it. And there's actually. If you're experienced enough, there's actually a lot to get from this solo. And it's kind of a continuation of what I was talking about last week. How some solos are more conceptual than others. And this is one of, this is such a case where you have to have the experience, the experience to know what to get out of this. And this is what I want to talk about in this video. And I think this is a very important topic because nowadays, um, in, in jazz education, they market things in such a way that it kind of convinces you that you have to learn all sorts of complicated things, complicated scales, complicated substitutions, complicated terminology, just so that you can seem cool. You can be part of the cool kids. And of course, all those things are fine and all that stuff, but I do feel that the simple stuff is often overlooked and one thing about my, my, my YouTube channel is not to say that all those fancy things that, that advertisers use to entice students are, are bad. No, they're, they're, they have their place in music education. But I feel sometimes that the, the simple stuff or the fundamental things are overlooked. And so this 
hopefully with this channel I can restore some of that balance. So stand by me in the key of G. Uh, the chord progression is G to E minor to C to D. Simple as that. Now, of course, you can play all your bebop lines over a G chord. You can play it that way. And it'll work. But what George played was nothing like that. It was just pure melody. And this is something that's very, very difficult to achieve because in order to play the solo that he played, you have to be able to hear in advance what you want to play. You need to have vocabulary in your ear. And uh, the proof is that actually he's actually scatting this solo at the same time. And uh, the solo that I played might not necessarily be 100% what he plays on the guitar. It follows closely what he was singing because it, doesn't, it didn't always match the, the guitar part and the, the scat. But anyway, if you really want to reach a really, really high level, um, obviously you have to practice real hard. But one priority you should make is the ability to connect your ears to your instrument as soon as possible. And that can take a lot, a lot of work. Uh, you're no longer just a guitar player, you're a musician. Uh, you, the guitar, and you yourself are as one. But not only do you want to connect your ears to your instrument, you also want to be able to hear things worth playing. Because I've said this in previous videos, there are some people who have perfect pitch. Basically, they automatically know how to connect their ears to their instrument, but they cannot improvise to save their lives. I've met so many people with perfect pitch who were, if I may be very honest, terrible, terrible, terrible improvisers. Why? Because they don't hear anything worth playing. And to hear anything, something worth playing, you have to listen to so much music, you have to think a lot about music, and you have to activate a part of your brain that tries to make sense of the music. And in order to do that in the beginning, what you might need to do is to, whatever instrument you play with, the guitar, you need to be listening to music with your guitar in your hands, and then you need to be activating this part of the brain where you hear something and then you try to figure out what it is on the guitar. And you have to do this so much that eventually, uh, it, well, it, it gets easier and easier and easier. You'll never master it because you'll always, there's always room for improvement. But at one point, you'll, you'll have done it enough that you won't need the instrument anymore and you can hear something in your head uh, and you just know where it is. And um, <clears throat> that takes many years of very careful listening and just activating this part of your brain. It's, this, it's the same part of, in my opinion anyway, the same part of your brain that helps you acquire new languages. It's not enough to just listen casually. You have to just, you have to activate this part of your brain that's trying to, to make sense of something. And when I say make sense of something, I don't necessarily mean in theoretical or technical terms. It's just kind of a, a feeling, an intuitive feeling that you have inside. So that's the thing you have to do with music. And as I said, you start you do this by starting in with your by starting to lift music while having your instrument in your hand and just try to figure things out when you figure out a line try to figure out um try to understand how it relates to the overall structure of the song so for example if i play this uh that just a little, that little phrase let's say i heard that phrase and then Okay, it's not enough to actually just learn that phrase. You have to see where it actually fits. Or oh, in this case, let's say it's a blues and G. So it's over a G chord or a G7 chord. Okay, that's what I mean, making sense of things. It's the same thing with languages. Say, um, I'm here in Taiwan and I was just hanging out with some of my expat friends. Uh, my, my American friend, Cody, <laughs> was just feeling down about his uh, Mandarin skills. I mean, he's, he hasn't been studying for very long. He feels that 
you know, in, in real life situations, he's having a lot of difficulty. And this other friend just, you know, reminded him, you know, for a guy who had only been studying for a year or whatever, you're doing pretty well. There are some people who have been here for 20 years uh, who don't speak the language at all because they're here, they're immersed in the language, but they have not activated that part of the brain, their ears, that allows them to passively absorb the language. In order to do that, you have to study the language, you have to try to uh, develop some vocabulary, so you have to do uh, pick up sentences, phrases for everyday life situation. And as you actively study, you will also eventually uh, activate this part of your brain that allows you to learn passively as well through positive reinforcement. Let's say you learn how to say puyong, which in Chinese means it's not necessary. So it's something you'll hear a lot. Let's say, do you need a bag? Ah, puyong. Now, if you had never activated that part of your brain that understand that uh, made connected puyong to not necessary, you can hear it passively for 20 years, but never actually learn puyong and never actually understand how it works. But let's say you actually studied puyong. Someone taught you, hey, you know, when someone is asking if you need a bag, you can say puyong uh, for I don't need. And suddenly you're aware of this phrase. And it's such a common phrase that you're going to hear it all the time in, in your day-to-day -day life. Puyong, puyong, puyong. And that is, this is, this is the passive reinforcement that I'm talking about. And it's this exact same thing with music. You need to start learning music instead of practicing like scales, arpeggios, and all those things, which is fine. But I really stress the importance of learning actual, actual music. Learn songs. Learn melodies. Learn the solos of your favorite players. But when you learn them, try to make sense of the context. Um, so there we go. That's my little rant. Let me talk about this solo. What's so great about this solo? It's unfortunately two choruses. And if uh, Linda Carter had not interrupted him, George would have gone for at least one more, maybe two more. It would have been wonderful. But anyway, let's work with what we have. The first thing I will say about this solo is to investigate the phrasing. And like I said, I do have a course on Sound Slice on phrasing. You should really check it out because it's really well researched. <laughs> Notice that George, for the most part, is never starting his phrases on bar one. On um, bar one, but like on the first beat of a new chord, which is something that is very, very common in, in among beginner improvisers. Let's say they're playing a standard. All right, new chord, start on beat one. New chord, start on B1. Here, no, the phrasing is crossing bar lines. And in fact, the solo starts on B4. So, four and, and here's where it starts. And one thing I want to say also is the time feel. Uh, well, I played it with my own time feel. But one thing that I noticed about George Benson is when he plays over these funk pop songs. Now, I'm not saying that uh, bebop isn't rhythmic. It definitely is rhythmic. But there's this style of phrasing in, in, in jazz, in mainstream jazz, bebop, where sometimes the players are super laid back or they float a little bit. I mean, some players also play very much in time, like Joe Pass. But... I noticed from having investigated some solos of George Benson, when he plays bebop, he does have this kind of like floaty-ish, high-risk uh, time feel. But when he plays like pop music, where like funky style uh, music, where it's even more rhythmic, he tends to be more on the beat, but still very relaxed. So when I recorded this solo, that's kind of the feel that I was going for. Never ahead of the beat. Really... Uh, with the beat, but maybe a little bit, just like a fraction, millisecond behind the beat. Uh, so that's what I went for. Um, <clears throat> try, to, try it yourself, actually, and try different things to see uh, what your preferences may be. I made a video about this some weeks ago, so you should check that out as well. So... <laughs> And then, okay, so that's on the G chord. 
Then the next bar, to get into the E minor, to go to lead into the E minor, he starts his phrasing before he anticipates uh, the next bar by playing this phrase. So it starts on B2. And notice kind of like the storytelling effect of this, and how it relates to the first phrase. He's not just playing some random unrelated idea. There's a flow. There's a continuity to this. Okay? And the same thing. To get to the next chord, again, B2. Now, that's very cool. By the way, this is all from the G major pentatonic scale. That's a cool move. So, and then on the D7, on the D chord, this is where he switches to kind of like a <clears throat> G minor mixed with <clears throat> major pentatonic uh, idea. It's just a bluesy idea though. So over the D, it's where he starts to play like a G minor-ish pentatonic idea, blues idea. And this thing is when he lands on G, so he resolves. So all that is very, very cool. And he's actually going to do that, do that on the second chorus. We're going to get there on the D7 chord. Oh, sorry, I keep saying D because I'm used to playing jazz, but it's just a D triad. Um, he also does pentatonic. So this D chord is the dominant chord in, in, in functional harmony. Functional harmony, if you don't know what that means, check out my harmony course. But uh, <laughs> the dominant chord is where you tend to want to have the most tension. And so he's playing something that's quite, quote-unquote, dissonant here. Because it's a D chord, but he's playing G minor pentatonic. I mean, with chromaticism mixed with G major. And this is very typical of blues music. So... Uh, it's very deliberate on George's part because it's something that he hears. But I bet he did it subconsciously. He just felt it was the right place to do it because it's a sound he heard somewhere uh, along his career or when he was growing up. I mean, he listened to a lot of rhythm and blues and all that stuff. Okay, so that's very, very interesting. And then he resolves on the G chord. So the chord progression is G. E minor, C, D, back to G. And then, when it starts again, uh, it starts once more on G. So, G, E minor, C, D, G, G, etc. So, let's say this is the first chord, which is G, and the last chord, the fifth chord, is a G as well. What's very interesting in this solo is that he does not treat the fifth chord the same as the first chord. The first chord he's playing very diatonically, you know, just a G major pentatonic. But on this fifth one, which is the turnaround, to bring us back to the first chord, he's playing this bluesy idea. So it's very, very interesting. It's a, it's a bluesy idea, and um, Django Reinhardt also does this in um, that one video that exists of him playing this song called J'attendrai. At the end of the chorus, on the C chord in the key of C, uh, during the turnaround, he does... So yeah, that's what Django does during the turnaround. So it's, it's just very, very interesting to not, even though it's the same chord, you treat them differently. You play more of a, something that has a little bit of tension on the fifth one, on the fifth chord or the, the last chord to bring us back to the first one, even though they're the same chords. So that's another opportunity to be playing, I guess, some minor pentatonic. Second chorus. Um, 
it's highly motivic and again it's just G major pentatonic it's just G major pentatonic you have five notes to choose from but he's deliberately choosing specific notes over specific chords subconsciously of course deliberately but subconsciously it's kind of an oxymoron I know but it's just how it is but um, it's all about the phrasing from the turnaround the fifth chord to the first chord there is uh, over the bar line phrasing <laughs> One. And then uh, it's all about the phrasing. And even though it's pentatonic scale, it's deliberately choosing specific tones. And then you have this thing. And that here's that again. It's a nice phrase. And here's actually a G, a G major scale over the C chord. Why did he decide to go to the scalar thing? It's not about thinking about scale, it's just about hearing something. He just heard this over the chord. Yes, it happens to be from the G major scale, but really it's just something that he heard. Oh, sorry. And then D chord, here comes the blues again. And then this thing. And then that's where Linda Carter interrupts him. And the rhythms of these phrases, they're, they're just perfect. It's one of the best solos I've ever heard, really. It's so short and it's such an obscure solo. I would urge you to check out a lot of George Benson's pop music playing, but not just George Benson, but like listen to great players playing over simple songs. See what they do. And you'll notice a lot of the times um, they're not necessarily quote unquote outlining the changes the way that a jazz school would teach you to outline changes. Sometimes they're just playing melodically. Because, you know, you go to jazz school, they're going to teach you, all right, we're going to learn about guide tones. And uh, you're going to play a solo over autumn leaves and you're going to try to nail the guide tones. sounding but it just sounds so much like an exercise and a lot of these players from the past actually probably didn't practice anything like that they just practice sound vocabulary they absorb a lot of vocabulary from an early early age in fact I would even dare say that a lot of musicians students who go to music school might be quote-unquote more knowledgeable maybe more technical than a lot of the masters of the past but the masters of the past sure could play some beautiful music. So, food for thought. And it's not just jazz guitar. What, what, what was very interesting, uh, I read this interview, I think it was uh, Paul Gilbert, who is known to be one of the best guitar heavy metal shredders in the world. He was talking about how when he was growing up, he wasn't listening to like heavy metal shred guitar with all these like patterns and all that stuff he was listening to classic rock because at that time there was not 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 so many guitar players doing the you know the shredding thing and if you listen to paul gilbert he's an amazing amazing rock improviser he can play really beautiful solos and then what happened was the generation that he influenced um, a lot of the musicians were not listening to quote unquote the simple music they were only listening to the shred stuff and practicing the shred stuff and I definitely noticed this, that they couldn't really improvise very well. I mean, they could improvise, but it was just like the, just shred patterns. Whereas Paul Gilbert, not only could he shred, but he also had the bluesy, I mean, you don't have to like the blues, but the melodic soloing in his playing. And I think the same, it's the same with a lot of jazz guitar. A lot of people, they learn all these fancy substitutions, all these fancy scales, fancy whatever. Maybe they can play outside and all these crazy concepts. 
But then I've actually witnessed this before with uh, at Berkeley. I, I didn't go to Berkeley, but I played with some teachers at Berkeley and we're playing some simple music. And I was just thinking to myself, all right, it's, it's very impressive, but that's just so not what we're trying to do here. <laughs> I remember we're trying to play, we were playing all of me and the guitar player, the teacher there was doing all the crazy voices. That's not necessary if you're playing like a swing tune like all of me, but anyway, that's just my opinion. As far as jazz is concerned, that's why I'm, I'm quite attracted to the really old style players who are more, who kind of rough around the edges and self-taught because it forced them to develop these kinds of these fundamental instincts that I that I find very very appealing musically now the last thing I would say is that let's say you've kind of acquired this skill to be able to play simple but melodic uh, vocabulary over simple songs you can also try to apply that over songs that have more complex changes apply this melodic way of playing um, where it's not again about clearly outlining the chords as they would teach you to do in music school and which is sometimes something that you could do and like it could sound very very good but sometimes you can let the rhythm section play the chords but you focus on something a little bit more melodic and as I said earlier, one thing you, sh you should do, <laughs> that I should do myself, is to focus a lot more on when I'm learning these jazz standards, learn the melodies, learn them very, very well. Like a song like Stella by Stella, you'd have no idea that it had all these quote unquote complicated chords. Not a complicated melody, is it? But then you have all these chords behind. Da da. Original chords. Da da da. Da da di. Da da da. Da 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 da. Well, I think those are the original chords from the movie. Uh, it's been a while, but yeah, that's what I mean. Let the harmony take care of the, the, the harmony. Let the rhythm section take care of the harmony and try to make a nice melodic solo. I've talked about this in some of my other videos. I think I did one last year around like the month of May, I believe, when I was in Tokyo. I explained this idea over uh, Django's composition, Djangology. I'm playing like a gypsy jazz guitar where you have this composition that has like all these fancy chords, but you're in your solo, you're not deliberately outlining each chord, which again, you could do, but I'm just showing you that there's another possibility out there. So there we go. Let me know what you think. Like, subscribe. Thank you.